but I prepared like two part, three parts of the, okay. of the discussion. First of all, in general, then really specific about sure. programming practices and ideas, because I still have many questions and you will definitely be able to answer them. And then in the end, something about the future. Okay. What's going to happen in the future? So first of all, the main thing is, uh, the main question I have is, uh, what is your story, your personal story? How did you came to that to that book? Like, are you a programmer? What's the background? Because this is a question which is okay. I have for. Right. So, uh, I had been a software developer most of my life. Well, most of my life. I started in computing in 1968. So it's the same year that software engineering was invented as a term. I uh, was a COBOL programmer. I did work in almost every area of software development, uh, all the way up to and including I was an IT manager for a state agency, government agency. Uh, so I had done all of these things. I was not really happy with what was, you know, the results with the things going on. So I went back to school to graduate school and I uh, decided to take anthropology and computer science both. The idea being that the computer science would teach me more about programming and the technical stuff. Anthropology might teach me something more about the human side. Teams, um, politics, management, all of these kinds of fun things. I uh, did that, uh, finished my degree and then I got a job as a professor and they wanted me more for my practical experience and knowledge than for my academic record. And so I got into the world's largest software engineering master's program. We had 600 students. And uh, while there I was, I started off teaching structured analysis and design, but things were, were starting to change. The object idea was just starting to come to the forefront and I founded an object lab at my university and we had real world customers and so we did we did commercial seminars we did uh, development work in object oriented things and then of course we taught the academic program in in objects so we ca we caught that wave right at the beginning so right in the the first commercial small talk was small talk 80 by 1990 Smalltalk was going to replace COBOL as the most popular language in the world. Mm -hmm. um, by 96, COBOL or Smalltalk was dead because everybody was doing Java. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an interesting story there, by the way. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, and then I wrote the book. And the book was, it actually came out at the point where objects were no longer really popular. But Agile was just starting. And Agile was founded by the people that used to do objects. So if you look at every one of the Agile founders, uh, whether it was XP or Scrum or whatever, they were all old small talk developers. And so, I, and, and so they would say things like, you know, Agile, you do a little bit of design, you do this. But the design that they were doing was object design. But they never said it. They just assumed that everybody knew what was going on. And so I wrote the book to try and say, look, if you're really doing Agile, you have to know about the kind of object design. Because these people, again, the people like Kent Beck and Ward Cunningham that were doing uh, Agile were behavioral object people. Uh, Kent Beck was the one that invented the CRC card, the uh, Collaborator Responsibility Class card. Um, they were not the data type people that mm -hmm. came to dominate objects and basically killed it off. Um, they were the original. And so they, they knew what they were doing when they said design it this way, but nobody else did. <laughs> so my book was to try and fill that gap and say, if you're going to do this, you need to know what, what was meant by objects. Why do you think a small talk died? And you call it died. I'm yes. <laughs> um, okay, small talk never died. It, um, it it was a research project at Xerox Park, and it was it was extremely successful. 
But then two things happened. The first thing was Apple. So everybody knows the story of how Apple went to Xerox Park and stole the the uh, local area network Apple Talk, uh, the graphical user interface that they put on the Mac and the Lisa. Um, what people don't know is that uh, at first, the first time they went to visit Xerox, they were forbidden to see Smalltalk. Xerox didn't want them to see Smalltalk because that was considered to be the best development of everything. Uh, Steve Jobs made a fuss because they had made an investment, cross investment in stock with Xerox, and so the Xerox people management forced Park Place or Park Xerox Park to show have Jobs Smalltalk. But they so they showed them he was really amazing of wow this is the future but they wouldn't license Smalltalk to Steve Jobs. If they had, then Smalltalk would have been the language of the Apple. Instead, they invented Object Pascal uh, to, to do that job. Uh, a few years later, uh, Xerox Park bought the largest Smalltalk product, the Digitalk uh, Smalltalk for PCs. They had several hundred thousand users. Xerox had, you know, 5,000 commercial users of their product. Mm -hmm. But they had a lot more money, so they bought Digitalk. And then they basically tried to force the Digitalk community into the same kind of licensing as they were doing for their corporate partners. And so nobody wanted to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So Smalltalk, basically, by that time it was all open source, and it became Squeak. And in Europe, there's a very thriving Squeak community. So Smalltalk is not dead, it's just in Europe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's not in the United States. Uh, the other, there was one other time too that Sun wanted to license Smalltalk to put as their base programming language on all of the Sun machines. Mm -hmm. And Oracle, or I mean Xerox, uh, said, no, you have to do this other kind of licensing. And Sun said, no, we can't do that. And so, I mean, it, it could have been what it was supposed to be. Um, but these, these kinds of business mistakes that were being made, uh, Sun in particular, they got so angry at Park Place, the vendors of Smalltalk, that they went back and commissioned the creation of Java. Mm -hmm. So Java was supposed to kill small, I mean, it was intended mm -hmm. to kill small, and it did. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a very interesting period of about four years where Smalltalk could do 10 times, 100 times what Java did. But Java was free. Mm -hmm. uh, and Smalltalk cost money. Uh, and so it eventually just won out for economic reasons. Uh, but things like uh, you, you could run Java bytecode in Smalltalk easily. I mean, it was it, it, the same interpreter just didn't care. Mm. If it was Java bytecode or if it was Smalltalk bytecode. So Java killed Smalltalk or Java killed object-oriented programming? Um, Java killed object-oriented programming too, big time. Mm -hmm. So before, before Java, there was a very intense debate between C++ and Smalltalk as to which was the true object-oriented language. And you would go to conferences like Oopsla and I mean the the debates and the discussions they almost led to fistfights you know people compared them to religious wars you know because both sides were just so adamant and so strong uh, and C++ is not an object-oriented language either it was never intended to be if you uh, if you look at what Straustrup wrote about what he was doing when he created C++ all he wanted to do was to create discipline for C programmers. He thought C programmers were unruly and undisciplined and you know, didn't write good code. So C++ was supposed to force them to write better code, more disciplined code. But he never once ever mentioned it being an object-oriented language. Other people did. They said, oh, well, you have classes in C++, therefore you must be object-oriented. Just like you have classes in small time. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. It was not intended to be. Uh, 
Java was intended, did claim to be object oriented, did borrow a lot of ideas from Smalltalk, uh, but it also, like Strassop with C++, if it interfered with the efficiency of the computer, they either left it out or found some other way of doing things directly. So sending messages from object to object mm -hmm. takes machine resources. It takes cycles to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you use dot notation, you can, get, you can cut that number of cycles down significantly. Yeah. And so, so they put dot notation into uh, Java, mm -hmm. where Smalltalk would never allow you to do anything to an object without sending it a message. Uh, mm -hmm. So... So the dot notation, the Java, C++, they all killed the idea of they, it. Yes, because they... Now uh, people are right. being taught in schools that Java is the object or in the programming. And they, that's the way yes. it has to be. So that's uh, it's a marketing scam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when Java was trying to get market acceptance, it was very valuable to say that it's an object-oriented language mm -hmm. because that's what people wanted. Mm -hmm. They knew it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the idea of objects probably was never really implemented in any programming language, even Smalltalk, uh, because people were constantly trying to make uh, compromises with what you could do with the machine, what the machine could understand, what you could compile and how to make it work efficiently. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole idea of a class, for instance, that's not object-oriented. Uh, classes have nothing to do with, with objects, but it was a way of efficiently storing code so that you could do maintenance in one place instead of many places. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to find the closest thing that there ever was to a true object-oriented language, it would be self. SELF. Mm -hmm. uh, there are nothing but objects. Mm -hmm. And there is only one, one class or one type of thing, and that's the object. And you can plug methods in, you can plug variables in, you can do all these kinds of changes. You can clone yourself. Mm -hmm. But there's no, no such thing as a class, and you know, it's all objects. Mm -hmm. But self never gained a great deal of popularity. So, mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of things people saying on blogs and in academic papers, in conferences, saying that, that the object-oriented programming is bad in general. Like mostly functional yes. programmers, uh, yes. people from Lisp, they're coming and right. saying this is mass. All these, I can, <laughs> I can give the quotes, but you know about them. Probably. Yes. <laughs> so this is this is very interesting, and the the functional people in particular. Uh, they are reinventing dynamic languages. Uh, that, I mean, they are reinventing the stuff that Smalltalk was doing, only giving it a different name, like dynamic language. Uh, they are reinventing things that Smalltalk was doing, calling it functional. Uh, they're reinventing things that Smalltalk was doing at the, at the programming level. We're talking about detailed programming level mm -hmm. and calling it something else. Um, and they go out of their way to try and say, oh, objects never work, never work, never work, whatever. <laughs> um, but it's, de it's a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have to go and reinvent a whole bunch of other kinds of superstructure to make functions work. So if you look around the world, you know, do you see any functions out there? <laughs> I don't see any. I see a whole heck of a lot of objects out there. Yeah. Uh, and so when, they, when they're doing something other than you know, machine level code, if they're writing uh, device drivers or things of this sort, functional programming makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. because your domain of interest is the machine. Bytes and bits. Bytes and bits and circuits and opcodes and things of this sort. Mm -hmm. And in that kind of a context, uh, functional programming makes a huge amount of sense. Mm -hmm. But if you're writing a payroll program, it doesn't. And so your design becomes very convoluted and complex in order to translate reality into functions. Yeah. And that was the biggest advantage of Smalltalk, 
is that you can take reality and express it directly in your small talk code mm -hmm. uh, without this, this translation kind of effect. So what about that, that, that quotes from people saying that object-oriented programming is just, uh, just in general yeah, the bad okay. idea? So, I've heard that. <laughs> yes. So at one level, it's absolutely true. Uh, I mentioned already the idea that it's inefficient to send a message instead of just doing a, a direct get, you know, oh, like a, a, a dot notation. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes longer, takes uh, cycles to do things. Uh, if you use inheritance, like in object-oriented program, like in Smalltalk, it's even worse mm -hmm. because you'll send a message to an object. The object says, I have no idea how to respond to that. It sends a message to its class saying, do we know how to do this? If it doesn't, it sends a message to a superclass. Yeah. So you've got all of these machine cycles before an answer comes back. Mm -hmm. So if, in that sense, yes, small talk programming in particular is really inefficient, therefore bad, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's some other you know, examples of that sort that when, you, when you're executing small talk code, it runs slower. So for a long time, people said, well, you can't write real-time systems in Smalltalk. It just won't have the performance necessary mm -hmm. to do so. Um, but two, two, two different groups did demonstrate that that wasn't true. So Dave Thomas, who was one of the earliest advocates of uh, Smalltalk and of object-oriented programming, uh, he worked as a professor at Carleton University in Canada he introduced Smalltalk, and Smalltalk became the first programming language in their Computer 101 class. Um, he founded a company, which he later sold to IBM, and they built uh, real-time software for like jet fighter planes in Smalltalk. Mm -hmm. And it was certainly fast enough, you know, to keep a jet <laughs> fighter in the air without being shot down. Uh, and then there was a company in Texas that did a lot of work with switching systems, power switching systems, where they had nanosecond, picosecond kinds of time budgets. And again, they did things in small talk mm -hmm. uh, and were able to develop it faster. Uh, and then when it came time to get performance, they would do little tricks like precompile method calls mm -hmm. so that you didn't have that messaging interpreting going on all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the advantage, you take two months to write your program, test it, prove it, and then you take two weeks mm -hmm. to optimize it. Or you could do C++ and take eight months mm -hmm. to get it to run. You know, I mean, your choice. Mm -hmm. uh, but people didn't seem to care. They're also complaining not about performance only. They're saying that object-oriented way of designing things turns, you know, the whole code into spaghetti code. Yes. What do you think about that? Um, they're blaming their inability to do design well <laughs> on the language. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> on the language. That, so there, there is one kind of thing that when you write a small talk program, it can look a lot like spaghetti code because in order to know what's going on, you're just following all of these messages as they go through the system. Yeah. Um, when it comes to debugging, the debugging tool is basically a list of all of the message sends. Mm -hmm. And you have to go through that and find the one that failed and then figure out why that object didn't do what it was supposed to do mm -hmm. and fix it. Um, I had students that would write a small time program and then they would spend weeks trying to trace the flow of control around the program. Well, your, your program, if it's well designed, should reflect a conversation among peers or equals. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a master controller mm -hmm. like other kinds of, like, like Java. You don't have a single place that, where all the control functions come from. The trade-off is, is that you lose, you know, it, it appears that you don't have any control, you don't have any um, logic or flow or whatever to your program. 
But the benefit is that it becomes a whole heck of a lot easier to write that program and it requires a whole lot, uh, a, a, a significant amount, uh, fewer amount of code lines mm -hmm. to do it. Uh, if you think about it, if you write the old style of programming, which was invented back in the 60s, you had a master control module at the top mm -hmm. that made all the decisions. Then you had some afferent modules over here that would bring data into the system. You had some process modules in the middle that would do transforms. And then you had efferent modules which transformed the output. But that master control module was the only one who knew what everything that was going on. So it becomes more and more and more complex. Uh, you can think about it, uh, the experiments back in the 1950s in the Soviet Union, where they wanted to centralize the economy and put all the decision making in Moscow. Well, you can imagine how complex that would be. Yeah. And we all know what the results were, too. Um, and, but the same thing's true of your code. If you, uh, you have a choice. You have very clear control, or you have simplicity, ease, flexibility, adaptability, all these other kinds of things, because you have distributed the responsibility to people. Um, Java programmers in particular, or C++ programmers, uh, they, they don't have any choice. I mean, you can't even create a class in Java without having a main routine. Yeah. I mean, this idea of a main and subroutines with all of the logic being in the main is so embedded in the thinking of programmers uh, that they, they, they can't get past that and design well-functioning object code. Mm. Totally makes sense. And now practical questions. The first one about classes, which puzzles me a lot. So okay. you're saying classes is, they're not supposed to be there, but only objects. Right. So okay. can you elaborate on that? Sure. A bit more. Because um, I'm writing classes. <laughs> well, yeah. You, you don't have any choice. Yeah, <laughs> I have to do that. Yeah. You, you don't have any choice. Um, But the, um, so the idea was that you're going to have objects and the objects are going to have, you know, code. Um, and if you have two objects that are similar, they may have similar code in them, right? Yeah. So when you do maintenance, it's just like any other kind of modular programming, you don't want two modules to have the same code in them because when it comes time to change it, Yep. you have to go and change it in two places. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of these objects running around, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So classes were an easier way to, uh, to bring all of that shared information into one place. So if I want to change the behavior of all my objects or I want to change the data structure in any of my objects, I can go one place to the class and change it there. And then automatically all the objects have that same behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a compromise. Uh, there's another thing also that you have to do, you know, where do objects come from? Mm -hmm. Well, in C++ you have a factory. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, in Smalltalk you don't, you have a class. So the class is the one that has the template for creating new objects. Yeah, the template, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so, the word I don't like. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but that's basically what it is. It's like the DNA, and so you just go in and clone that DNA mm -hmm. in the class mm -hmm. and create a mm -hmm. new object. Mm -hmm. But all of these things are just conveniences for the programmer. Mm -hmm. uh, they they aren't essential to the to the idea of an object. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, they're things to make the job of programming easier. Mm -hmm. So in my book, I say this is a secondary concept. Mm -hmm. The class. Uh, it's part of the vocabulary. Okay, it's not essential. Uh, you have objects, you have messages, you have encapsulation. Uh, those things are absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Things like classes and inheritance are compromises mm -hmm. with the practical issues of doing programming and with the capabilities of the machine. 
But in Java, we, we, we have something in that classes. They're not just templates. We may have methods uh -huh. in them. For <laughs> <laughs> but you're not supposed to. <laughs> that was I want to, yes. yeah, that's my question. So, uh, again, I, I tried to make the point in the book that a class shouldn't do anything. Uh, so, in Smalltalk, you have class methods. In Java, You're not too. supposed to use them. It's bad design. Um, it's, it's a return back to kind of a command and control kind of way of thinking if you're using a class method. Uh, you're, you're trying to take something that should be the responsibility of the objects mm -hmm. and for whatever reason trying to consolidate it and put it into the class so that the class can do it on behalf of the objects. Mm -hmm. And you know, people uh, come up with arguments about you know, why they had to do it that way or whatever, but they're never very good arguments. They're, mm -hmm. it's, they, they didn't think of an alternative and so, oh, this is easier. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Smalltalk put them in there right at the beginning mm -hmm. as class methods as things to do, it just tempted people to do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're, I have never heard in 30 years a good reason for using a class method. Mm -hmm. I can give you one. Uh, the Android SDK, for example, which okay. is Java code entirely. So Google is promoting it. In order to create an app for Android phone, you have to use Google SDK. And in the Google, in this Android SDK, they have uh, explicit instructions for programmers which are saying you have to use static methods, which are class methods, because they're faster. The Android is slower, is slow, so don't use objects. They are like saying, don't use objects, make as little as possible objects. So always try to rely on the static methods. Okay. So, so that's my second question. This is performance versus object-oriented thinking. Right. So what, what do uh, we do? Okay. Computers are, I mean. So for, first thing is, is that I have to confess that I am not that great a programmer, right? <laughs> uh, I am a good designer. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would lay a small wager, at least, mm -hmm. that if I, I could look at the design and find a better way of doing things that didn't mandate the need for doing class methods. So yes, if you build an architecture this way, mm -hmm. uh, you, you build a 500-story building, you better have a really fast elevator. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But uh, is the 500-story building the best design for this problem? Or would you have been better off building an arcology or something, uh, a different kind of distributed ar uh, architecture uh, that allows for massive populations, but you don't have 500-story yeah. elevator shafts in it? Mm -hmm. uh, you might have a whole bunch of shorter elevator shafts. So it's, uh, you, could, you could break up the functionality of Android in different ways so that no piece of it was that big that mandated the static methods. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so there, there's almost always a design alternative mm -hmm. that eliminates the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, now, oper operating systems are a really sore point with objects. Uh, I worked for a couple of years teaching a class on object-oriented operating systems. And there have been a number proposed out there, but the architectural design of them is always the same. You have a big master control something or other, <laughs> uh, whereas if you if you architected your operating system to reflect the, the objects in the hardware, uh, you have the computer. Well, the computer is nothing but a collection of components. And the computer can tell you, oh yes, I have a disk drive, yes, I have a bus, yes, I have a this. Memory, whatever. You know, disk, whatever yeah. it is that comprises the computer. Um, and then the different parts would each take responsibility. So if I'm a disk drive, I can, accept your string and store it and give it back to you, keep track of it, you know, keep it safe, all these kinds of things. Um, I can even queue. If I get two requests at once to save something, I, I can establish my own queue. I don't have to have the operating system telling me 
well, do this one first and then do this one second. I mean, I'm more than capable of doing that myself. And so if you uh, look at the behavior of all the components of the computer, give them all the distributed capability, an operating system becomes, you know, a couple thousand lines of code. Mm -hmm. And not the, what, however many millions or trillions of lines of code Windows has these days. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the design. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, what's the balance between performance and uh, nice design? So some people say mm -hmm. performance goes first. We need to yes. write code for computers. They say, right. Don't, who cares about these beautiful designs? But this right. Basically, it's just you know right. instructions for computers. Why do you so much pay attention to the design and all these objects? I can create a static method. It works. Right. The software works, and it's fast, faster than yours. <laughs> that's, the, <laughs> that's the argument. Yes. Um, if you're doing something once, you're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. When's the last time you wrote a program that didn't have to be changed, <laughs> you know, Never happened. in six months or a year or 10 years from now. No, yeah. Um, and if you write it the way that you want to write it, or I, I know you don't want to write them, um, <laughs> but if yeah, you write them in this, you know, this, in this, uh, this efficient mindset, way, yeah, yeah, this efficient mindset, way, yeah. um, your code is going to be unmaintainable. It's going to work just fine today but mm -hmm. not if the requirements change. You, you, you won't be able to maintain it. You won't be able to change it. And in point of fact, that's exactly what we see. I have seen, uh, well, it's been a while, uh, but about 10 years ago, uh, IBM's latest and greatest big you know, uh, computer would put itself into 1401, the original IBM computer, emulation mode. So you've got this computer that can run, you know, trillions of operations a second. Mm -hmm. Will put itself, shut itself in, in a, into a mode of operation of like a hundred operations per second, so that it could emulate a 1401 computer, so it could run a piece of code that nobody could fix, <laughs> but was still essential somehow, mm -hmm. you know, to the company. So that that kind of thing is. is so what goes there. first, the performance or? Performance always goes last, and you can go all the way back to the 1970s, and you know when software engineering was invented and where this mindset actually originates. This, uh, and you can look at any kind of programming manual out there, and they always tell you performance is last. You you uh, you do your design, uh, you optimize your design. Uh, you code your design and test your design, you make the program work, and then you figure out how to make it perform mm -hmm. faster. Uh, because the things that are going to ultimately matter long term is the design. Mm -hmm. The performance is going to change next year when you get a new computer. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, <laughs> So why spend all of this time, you know, optimizing for a computer that's going to be obsolete in six weeks? I agree. <laughs> but if you do it, your, your design right, then, uh, you know, it, it moves over to the new computer just fine. And yes, you'll have to do some work to re-optimize performance to take advantage of the new skills. But that's really small amount of effort compared to this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, we live in a... Uh, a very practical world. It's a very interesting world as a programmer. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the average longevity at one job for a programmer? A year, maybe two years. A year, like maybe? That. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe like two. That. Maybe two, yeah, rarely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what's the average length of time of doing a project? Longer than a year, I think. Maybe even, I don't know. Yeah, the average is around two years. Maybe two years, yeah, something yeah. like that, yeah. Okay. So the odds are you, as a programmer, you're going to work gonna on one thing in one place, <laughs> and when it breaks, you're going to be somewhere else. Yeah. So exactly what is your incentive <laughs> for doing it right? You know, that's somebody else's problem. Now, that sounds really, really cynical. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying that programmers consciously think this way, but it's just the nature of the economics and the social structure of programming. Mm -hmm that you never have to face the consequences of, of your actions. Almost never. Nobody ever gets fired because the program didn't run. 
you know, you may have layoffs, but hey, you're working at a new place, you know, two days later, and uh, I mean, there's just no consequences. And you think it's bad? Oh, yeah. For the industry? Yes. That programmers don't have consequences? Yes. And what that consequences should be, would, would be? Um, Financial, career? Um, I think it should be kind of reputation, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, your, your reputation is something that you should want and should be proud of. Mm -hmm. And if uh, uh, in the world of gaming, for instance, you can get a reputation as a wizard or as this kind of a player in the, in the games, and it's maintained by your peers, really. So anybody that wants to can rate you or say, oh yes, I, I certify, you know, I, I have worked with, with Igor and I know this and, uh, you know, he's a great guy, he's a wonderful code. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have more and more people saying that kind of thing, then you've got a good reputation. Mm -hmm. If someone comes in and says, hell, <laughs> I would never work for this guy again, <laughs> you know, he comes in, he's a prima donna, he writes, you know, really crappy code. and. Mm -hmm. uh, and then bosses people around. So you should have at least that kind of reputational consequences. People should know whether you're good or not. Mm -hmm. And it should be something that you can't, oh, I am wonderful. Mm -hmm. It should be based on, I've worked with him. I can, you know, I can certify or testify or, you know, uh, I believe he's really good. And for these reasons. Uh, and so if you do crappy work, you're going to have a bad reputation. And uh, so, so that's the kind of consequence I would make. There have been, over the last several decades, there have been all kinds of attempts to license software developers. And in fact, in the state of Texas, you cannot call yourself a software engineer because engineers have to be certified by the state and licensed by the state. Uh, and they face consequences. If their building falls down or their bridge falls down, they get sued. Um, in software, we don't have anything like that. And we have all kinds of instances. Uh, don't know, uh, you're, you're probably not old enough uh, to remember a, a thing called the Therac 25. Uh, it was a piece of software that controlled radiation uh, devices for uh, oh, like mostly like cancer patients where they did radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. And this software was written so badly uh, that it, it, had, it had these bugs in it that it would cause from time to time a uh, hundred times the dose of radiation. So they actually killed people. I mean they irradiated people and killed them they irradiated people and made them really, really ill. Nobody was ever held responsible for that. Mm -hmm. Nobody went to jail. The company didn't get closed down. I mean, nothing. Uh, uh, yeah. Why, why, why do we tolerate that? But I, but I think the biggest thing should be reputation. We should have some kind of a semi-formal way of doing peer-to-peer -peer evaluation reputation-based responsibility. Um, yeah. That's part of being a professional, right? Yeah, makes sense to me. One more practical question. What do you think about whether object-oriented programming is imperative or declarative? We're arguing a lot with my <laughs> friends about that. And <laughs> right. I'm not going to say my what I understand. Like, I want to hear your first. Um, Could I say neither? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. um, it's, in, it's in a category for us uh, by itself. So usually, uh, yeah, it all, it all depends upon uh, the, the kinds of messages that you're sending, right? So I can send an imperative message to an object. I can say, you are X. Mm -hmm. And you better be X. You know? <laughs> uh, a setter is a kind of imperative message. You know, your your instance variable now contains this value. Mm -hmm. 
Um, or I can say, uh, you know, give it other kinds of orders. I can ask questions so it can be interrogative. You know, I can ask a collection, do you have any blue things? You know, that's an interrogative programming, right? Mm -hmm. um, declarative programming, I can, I, it, 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 it's a mixture of all of these things and it depends on what kind of a message you are sending. But as a category, it's usually uh, separated from declarative, imperative, um, uh, functional. I mean, the, these different kinds of names. Objects is almost always its own group, so it, it mm -hmm. doesn't belong in any of these other categories. Mm -hmm. But you can make it look like anything you want. Mm -hmm. uh, I can conceive, I'm not a good program, but I can see a program where, again, you had some kind of a master controller and it just did nothing but issue orders to all the other objects. That would be imperative, 100%. Yeah. yeah, and then it's 100% imperative program. I mean, I can see writing. Yeah, but is it good? Program. No. Yeah. I see a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and again, you know, that'll get back to the. The, the whole notion of a master control module and how you control that, how you control its complexity and stuff. Uh, if, if my master control module doesn't have to make any decisions, but all it has to do is issue orders according to some preordained script of, mm -hmm. uh, of sequence, that's easier to write than one that has to, well, what, what's going on down there and you know, what do I do about it in this circumstance? That's much harder to write. Mm -hmm. So imperative is easier to write it and understand. Be. It can be, mm -hmm. but it's totally inflexible again. You know, uh, it'll work once in one set of circumstances, and if anything changes, yeah, any of the requirements change at all, mm -hmm. even a little bit, then you basically have to rewrite the whole thing. Okay, and then the next question. What do you think about this integration, which is very popular now, of integration between object-oriented programming and functional? They bring features from functional programming languages into Java, for example. Like this Java 8 is mm -hmm. full of features from functional, pure functional programming. Mm -hmm. So now the function is a first class citizen. So you can, you can refer to the function, you can assign it to the variable, you can say that variable A equals to function Z, something like that. So they start, this is Java, Java 8. What do you think about this mix of two, two, two paradigms? Yeah. Uh, is it the right direction or? It's. It's, it's probably a, a necessary thing. It's, it certainly is nothing new. Uh, you can look at, uh, look at Java itself. It was intentionally designed to include things from Smalltalk and to include things from C++. Actually, from C, directly from C. Mm -hmm. So it was a hybrid right, right then of uh, uh, procedural programming and object programming. Uh, look at something like Ruby. Ruby intended to emulate Java and C and Smalltalk. And so all of these features are in there. Uh, the reason being is that it, it's kind of an old adage that you, know, you, you need a tool kit. You don't need a single tool in your, uh, you know, your building kit. Uh, so that you have the ability that if, if this problem requires a function, I should be able to use a function to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. If this problem requires a class or an object, I should be able to create an object. Um, and you know, in a, in a very real sense, this is, is, is true, that You do need different tools for different kinds of circumstances, and it's more efficient for a programmer if they're all incorporated into a, into a single language. The problem is, again, it's a psychological, not a technical one at all, is that uh, if you started off in programming in language X, and now you're using language Y, and it has features of language X and language Q and language P, which ones are you going to use? 
probably the one you started from. Yeah. Yes, you're going to use everything in that language of X, and it's going to be very rare that you use P and Q. Yeah. Um, and, and it has absolutely nothing to do with what you can or should or, or anything of this sort, or whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Yeah, you just it just more. has yeah. to do with you know human psychology mm -hmm. that you're not. And so you see uh, Ruby programmers writing Java in Ruby. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, it's or even Perl sometimes or Python. Yes. Yeah, that, that yes. kind of stuff. So, my, my, because my concern is that people move these functionality features into object-oriented languages, and mm -hmm. we're kind of losing the idea of object-oriented thing. They yes. start thinking more about. Yes. Um, yeah. you, but you're all, if you're a language designer, mm -hmm. and therefore if you are a particular language user, you are always kind of making compromises between what it is that you want to say uh, and what you want to say things about and what the computer allows you to, to do. Mm -hmm. and so uh, the old, old adage, that, you know, computers are stupid. They have a very narrow little language that they know how to, to process or to deal with. Uh, the world is really, really interesting and complicated. So whenever you're trying to design a language, you're trying to design something that the computer can understand and that the programmer can understand and that the programmer can use to think with to solve problems out here in the world. And so you, you want to make as smooth a transition as you possibly can. So a language like C does a really, really lousy job of doing this because C is what the programmer speaks and nothing else. And so the burden on the programmer is huge. You have to figure out the real world. You have to figure out how to design some kind of a solution for a problem in that world. And then you have to figure out how to translate that into C code. All of that's on you. You come along with a language like Smalltalk and it embeds a model of the real world. So um, sometimes it's a metaphor. So if you're drawing an object in small talk, uh, you have a pen, which is a metaphor of a pen in the real world. Well, what can I do with a pen in the real world? So, so I have this kind of intellectual model. So if I want to draw a picture in small talk, it's relatively easy to conceive of what that would look like in the real world, what I would do if I was an artist with paper and pencil, mm -hmm. and then articulate that in code, because the model is there to help me. Mm -hmm. do that translation process. So small talk can be a whole lot easier to use to express things uh, than other languages can. Mm -hmm. uh, and every programming language will have some kind of a model built into it. Uh, so a functional programming language has a model which is based on mathematics on a particular kind of calculus, the lambda calculus. Yeah. And, you know, that's a model of the world. Isn't it a very easy one to use? You know, how, how, many, how many of your colleagues yeah, you know lambda that. calculus? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or could, you know, uh, anyhow. So it, it makes it much harder to do that translation because the model doesn't fit really well. The best example of that ever is relational databases. Mm -hmm. uh, so COD came up with this mathematical model mm -hmm. of information and a way of, well, not information, of data. But he said that if you can put your data, if you, if you can organize and structure your data in this way, and then you write an SQL query, you can mathematically prove that that query will produce the correct results. Yeah. Okay? So, number one, nobody knows how to write SQL correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, it's Boolean logic. People don't do Boolean logic really well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the relational model itself, the uh, tuples and things of this sort, uh, are not natural. That's not the way we think about stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to decompose it, to normalize it so that you can store it in that form 
and then to write a perfect SQL query just so you can prove that you got the correct results. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's overkill. Yeah. But I mean, it's this huge model, and people have spent billions and billions of dollars, trillions of dollars over the years, trying to make it work. Uh, but I have never, in 50 years, I have never ever seen anybody run a perfectly normalized database or write as perfectly normal SQL queries because it's horribly inefficient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you, you might normalize your data and then when the uh, uh, database administrator actually creates the database, he does all these little denormalization tricks so they can run in real time. <laughs> yeah. uh, There's no calculus yeah. anymore. It's so, just, why have a perfect model if you can't implement it? Mm -hmm. And it makes things so much harder. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it is really, really, really hard uh, to normalize data. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not something that comes easy to anybody. Uh, and then you have to figure out how to get it back. And I mean, it's just a huge waste of effort. And I see the same thing with the programming languages. Mm -hmm. if, you, if your language is based on this artificial model, it's going to make things harder, not easier, mm -hmm. to write code. What do you think about inheritance? A few more words. You, you said it that it's it's a it's a burden, but can you explain? Because yeah. many people use it, and uh, me as well, me as well. Um, but I feel that there is something wrong in that. But oh yes. So inheritance, you can you can look at it as in a couple of different ways. One is you can just look at it as a taxonomic structure, which aids your your cognition. Uh, and it's something that we do naturally and normally all the time. So it's a, it's a whole lot easier to think about kids than to have a name for each of those six kids that are in the swimming pool over there. Yeah. And if I say, hey, kids, be quiet, uh -huh. that's, a, that's a whole lot easier than to say John, Charlie, Joe, Sally, and, <laughs> and Becky. Mm -hmm. So we, we use taxonomies. Uh, to just make sense of the world and to have economical uh, kinds of uh, features. Uh, but we can, we can make mistakes with it as well. Uh, and when we get into this kind of formal or technical inheritance in a programming language, we can do that very easily. We can do it with data. Uh, So, one of the way of, ways of defining classes is you have objects, uh, you find out what the attributes of your objects are. So this is the data approach to doing objects, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And then you create uh, classes, hierarchy of classes, based upon shared attributes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a name and I have a name, then we're a member of the same class. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, if I have a name and you have a name and the children have names, mm -hmm. then we aren't the same class because we're adults and they're children, but we belong to the same super class yeah. of people. Mm -hmm. And we build these big hierarchies, but it's all based on data. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these kinds of taxonomies always break down. Mm -hmm. So you can look at uh, the Linnaean taxonomy is exactly that kind of thing where Linnaeus categorized all of the plants and animals in the world. And so he's got mammals over here as a class because they got these shared attributes. They've got birds over here as a class. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you have a platypus, which has fur, mm -hmm. lays eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it breaks. Yeah. So these kinds of taxonomies always break. Or they get really complex because um, if, um, if I was in an accident and lost an arm, I'm no longer a member of your class. Mm -hmm. Because you have two arms, I only have one. And I can't have two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have to create a new class. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at uh, th these kinds of taxonomies, and, and the, the logic is always, again, it, the more classes we have, the more inheritance we have, the easier it is to reuse things or to, to do whatever. 
Not true. It gets more and more and more complex. So uh, the world's, as far as I know, the world's largest small talk program uh, project was a thing called the Lynx Project at Cargill. Cargill is the largest privately held corporation in the United States. And they, uh, uh, they, they do grain processing and futures trading and things of this sort. It basically, it's a big grain hand. And they wrote this program. When they started the program, they brought in every person in the country that was an object-oriented expert to advise them. And they came up with, with a design but the company had just finished spending several million dollars on creating an enterprise-wide data model. Mm -hmm. So they had all these data entities, normalized or semi-normalized, whatever. Uh, and they decided, well, we're going to use that. We're, you know, a data entity is a class. Mm -hmm. So they all of a sudden, in their small time program, have 100,000 classes. Mm -hmm. They needed 1,000, mm -hmm. maybe classes to do the work. So just look at how complex it got. Mm -hmm. And they did it because they thought they were going to save money with this inheritance and this, this mm -hmm. commonality. But, but you don't. Um, you, you misconceive inheritance. Um, because it's based on data. Yeah. Because That's it's based point. on yeah. data, because it's uh -huh. based on... Not on behavior, but on data. Yeah, it's not based on, ba on behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, you come up with a very different taxonomy mm -hmm. if, if things were classed on behavior rather than data or attributes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the range of behaviors that a human being can engage in mm -hmm. are pretty much universal. It doesn't matter whether you're black, white, red, yellow, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. The potential, the kinds of behaviors that you can do, mm -hmm. are the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why don't we have one class human being mm -hmm. instead of blacks and whites and Scandinavians and Russians? Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever mm -hmm. if you're really using behavior. Uh, and even when they in, uh, uh, introduced the idea of classes and you were teaching people to do classes, there was, you were warned, do not make your classes into a pyramid, you know, a, a multi-layer pyramid, mm -hmm. which you would think you would want to do if you want efficiency and maximize this sharing of resources and so mm -hmm. on. Instead, your inheritance tree should be very wide mm -hmm. and then maybe one or two levels mm -hmm. here and there along that, mm -hmm. that breadth. I mean, so we, we knew right from the beginning that you shouldn't do this kind of inheritance yeah. model. Mm -hmm. uh, but people did it anyway.